Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now, the conversation you've always wanted to have about the continent. I'm Martine Dennis. Today, as African Union troops continue their gradual withdrawal from Somalia, even with a replacement AU force, can Somali forces contain armed groups like Al-Shabaab? A seat on the UN Security Council. How far has Mogadishu come on its path to peace, prosperity and security? We ask a senior member of the PM's office. And how can African countries make best use of tech, including AI? We have a look at Malawi, which is embracing digital transformation. And yet less than 20% of the population have access to electricity. And as France prepares to vote in a snap election, why the rise at the far right in Europe matters to Africa and to Africans. Let's get started. Many of you will now be familiar with the wonderful Patrick Smith, editor of Africa Confidential. Hey, Patrick. Patrick's a bit frozen at the moment, but um, I reckon that he will unfreeze at some point. But making her debut on Africa Here and Now is the superb Veronique Edwards, a talented veteran of international broadcasting. Vero is standing in for Donu, who's actually traveling at the moment. So Vero, welcome. It's so lovely to see you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, thank you. Long overdue. First, I've been struck by how many people have been suggesting that Somalia has reached a critical point, a milestone in its development. It's still one of the poorest nations on earth. It's beset by extreme weather events and conflict. Yet, there are other developments like being elected to the UN Security Council, which has been widely celebrated. It's joining the East African community, but a fifth of the population faced crisis of emergency food insecurity. Earlier, Patrick and I called up with Abdi Hakim Ainte, who's Director of Food Security and Climate Change in the Somali Prime Minister's office. Now, Somalia is being described as the second most vulnerable country to climate change by the Green Climate Fund. And obviously, you've had major droughts. You've had at least three major droughts, um, followed by catastrophic flooding. What's the situation now? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for having me here again, and I appreciate your team for in the, uh, bringing it to my voice to this uh, <clears throat> important and new broadcast. So, uh, yeah, Somalia is still continue to face uh, those cyclical droughts that too often comes uh, in about a year or two years or so, uh, primarily because of the climate shocks that are causing these uh, droughts and, 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 and uh, sometimes famine. So we are now going through a season called Gu, which is a, a rainy season. And in fact, this morning, as we record, they, there is a heavy pouring rain on the streets of Mogadishu and some part of, the, of Somalia. So what happens is that sometimes those rains, they can uh, rain on a vulnerable communities that are makeshifted in camps in a rural area and the outskirts of Mogadishu. And they don't live in a strong. I mean, we're talking about a, a close to 3.8 million people who live in these makeshift camps, you know, these tents. And when the rains happen, as you can expect uh, the result, there's no food, there's no water, there's no electricity. They don't have the luxury of living in uh, strong uh, houses. So it displaces. So the rain displaces, and then it creates that vicious uh, cycle of these people needing a service and a support. And this is exactly what I think is the core of the question should be. I mean, how do you build a strong and resilient society that can withstand those shocks that are coming in every two years or so? Now, the latest figures that I've come across, Abdi, is that about a fifth of the population is facing emergency food insecurity, which is just one level above famine isn't it? What's the government's response, given that the humanitarian um, appeal is desperately underfunded? That's right. I mean, uh, the current government, led by the President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, together with my Prime Minister, uh, um, has put forward a very bold vision. And that vision uh, has um, laid out clearly that we need to lift this population out of this poverty trap. How you do that, then you need a vision, then you need a plan, and then you need uh, resources. So it is in these three layers that you have to uh, work it together and make sure that you create an environment for those people 
So as a government, we have a, a plan and our plan that is that, you know, we need, uh, first of all, to understand the, the magnitude of the challenge. And the magnitude of the challenge is absolutely clear. I mean, it's, a, it, as you said, people are very much on the borderline of a, a famine. And if that happened, it's absolutely a catastrophic of the size of the scale of 1993. So we're, we're doing as a government everything that we could possibly do, number one, by uh, renegotiating with our partners on terms. Who are our, our, our partners? Our partners are um, those external donor community who are financing our development programs and the humanitarian community and asking a very simple question. Should we continue to have a $2 billion humanitarian money in every, in every year with virtually no concrete impact or should we start a new paradigm? And that new paradigm is the one that we are heavily focused on. And that's why we have um, now something called the Somali National Transformational Plan. It's very much the development vehicle for Somalia for the next four years. And it has a pretty clear layout and plan as to how we can move out, out of this humanitarian emergence or crisis. Give us the basis of what that plan is. I mean, you have been... Um, dramatically aided, haven't you, by the decision of the Paris Club creditors in March uh, to to uh, absolve Somalia of what ninety percent of its two billion dollar debt. That was burden on on us. That was lurking in in our shoulder for the last thirty plus years. So they have written off, but that did not happen out of a blue. It just happened at ten years of extreme painful reform economic package that we have negotiating and collaborating with the, with the global uh, financing institutions such as the World Bank and IMF. But that is the beginning of the new journey. It's not the end of itself. So what we're starting is a new journey that would entail a new physical discipline. And that discipline would involve, you know, restructuring our revenue mob- mobilization institutions, restructuring our governance structures, trying to come up with a uh, very bold and uh, transformative uh, market-based uh, sort of uh, programs. The new National Transformational Plan, which now uh, been rolled out, contains four major pillars. I mean, there's economic, there's a governance pillar, and then there's a social uh, a pillar, and there's economic pillar, and then there's a food security and climate pillar, all of which reinforcing one another. And, and it has a very clear ambition plan, which is, I mean, how do you uh, transform your, your, your governance institutions that will then inform your social and economic pillars. And, and to do that, then you need a, a, a concerted effort uh, with all the uh, government institutions, both at the national level as well as the subnational level. Abdi, how much of the economy do you think is in what they call the formal sector? I mean, in terms of that this government can actually have any influence over, and how much is, is, is just really decentralized, privatized, uh, informal activity that you can't really get tax from and you can't really regulate? How much is, is that changing now? I think that's a very good question. So the, the informal economic is very vast and it's a very elaborate one that it you know stretches across the country. And I think the government have uh, you know gradually starting to levy tax on those private uh, sectors. For example, the Minister of Finance is now introducing a new taxation uh, sort of a, a regime on the telecommunication industry, which I think is the by far the most biggest uh, you know uh, money making institution in the countries. And then we also introduced a new taxation also on the housings and as well as other informal economic uh, sectors. It's not going to be an easy one. I mean, as we gradually you know strengthen governance in structures and institutions, then then we will be able then to. Uh, put a tax on those ec- uh, informal economic. It's- Abdi, we haven't talked about, of course, the other major factor in life in Somalia, and that is security. Um, with the African Union troops continuing with the gradual withdrawal uh, from uh, Somalia, there is, of course, great concerns that the Somali national forces are not capable of managing uh, the armed groups, among them, of course, Al Shabaab. What can you tell us then about the state of preparedness of the Somali national forces who are being trained by the Americans, by the Brits, uh, among others? So the Somali National Army 
like every government uh, governance institution, they are also undergoing through uh, very tough reform. And uh, we started off about a decade or so, uh, a military that is nearly incapable of, you know, defending the 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 airport and the the basic key installation of government, but now able to go out in in front line and you know fight and battle with the Al Shabaab. So so the army is really going through that reform. And, uh, and and there is a, a degree of confidence in the public that the army, first time ever showing a great resilience and pushing the Al-Shabaab out of major town. You know, the president was out in the front line and was leading the war from the front. Uh, and the Somali National Army, without the support of basically, the, I would say, the, the African Union troops, have captured and regained a large swath of territory from Al Shabab. That itself I, is a, is a, signifies the 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 uh, the strong and the the robustness of our uh, of the army. Uh, but it's again, it, it's a it's a long way to go. Uh, I think, as you know, now we have a, an, an atmis which is looking out how the the African uh, foreign troops, which has been uh, present in Somalia over the last two decades transition out of the country and hand over the power to the Somali army. This week, the African Union have adopted a new mandate, a new resolution, which is essentially, uh, you know, downgrade this and uh, the number of the troops into, I mean, a sizable number, but will only patrol and protract the key installations such as the port and the airport and the, the, the embassies and the green zones. But it would give a room for the Somali National Army to very much control and run the business in the country's security affair. Uh, uh, Abdi, um, how much control do you think the federal government in Mogadishu has over the rest of the country? I know when the president, Hassan Sheikh, first came in, one of his big strategies to combat al-Shabaab was to form alliances with the regional chiefs. And that seemed at first to be very, very successful. But uh, over the last year or so, there seem to have been some glitches in that relationship. Well, the federal member states, I think they are part of the uh, the federal structure of the country. Um, our governance structure is a two is a two system governance. There's a federal government uh, in Mogadishu, and then there's a federal member states in the regions. I think it um, the president took a very um, bold uh, and courageous you know position that uh, that he should strengthen his collaboration with those federal member states the relation so far has been a very good and that's why you know the, the war on shabab was making a significant headways had it not been uh, the collaboration between the federal member states and the government of Mogadishu, it would could it could have definitely taken a, a, a different turn so it is that relation i think the, the, the war is gaining and making a momentum. And I think that's why they also some of there is a, a modicum of stability, even in their uh, respective uh, areas of the, those federal member states. But Mogadishu does have a bit of a problem on its hands with regard to Somaliland, obviously, and the uh, arrangement that has been struck with Addis Ababa. That is a continuing problem for Mogadishu, isn't it? Not to mention also the situation regarding a new constitution um, and Puntland, who is also cozying up with Addis Ababa and is not, uh, and is blocking the passage of this new constitution. Well, Somaliland is a completely different ball game, Martina. Uh, I mean, this is a, a, a state that has been um, seeking a secession over the last thirty plus years, and to their credit, really made a significant uh, headways, both in terms of their economic as well as their social political infrastructures. Uh, but that until uh, the first January of this year, when they have signed a unilateral uh, MOU with the Ethiopian government, which essentially grants Ethiopia government the Ethiopia to uh, have a unilateral access in in some part of Somalia, and that has created a new tension between Mogadishu and uh, and as well as in, in Hargeisa, and I think that's where I think the uh, now. The, the biggest uh, challenge uh, lies in in how do we, I mean, how do we make sure that Somaliland continues to be part and parcel 
of the federal structure of the country, which they are claiming they are not part of it. But hostilities between uh, Mogadishu and Addis Ababa are such that there is the prospect of Mogadishu throwing out 8,000 Ethiopian troops that are part of the African Union mission. Is that likely to happen? So the National Security Officer uh, and the Security Apparatus team made that very clear that should Ethiopia continue its infringement on Somali's territorial integrity, then that would also uh, be a clear violation in our territory. If they continue to, that, to do that, then the likelihood of the Ethiopian troops to withdraw would, would be very eminent. I mean, no country would accept a complete infringement on their territory. And I think that what, that's what Ethiopia has been flagrantly doing over the last uh, three months since they have entered an MOU agreement with Somaliland. Abdi, how bad could this actually get between Ethiopia and Somalia? I mean, uh, older characters would remember the horrendous wars in the 1970s, the Ogaden War and, and, and so on. Do you think that there is a diplomatic solution to this? And, and given the already bad instability in the region, um, are you putting like 100% into, st- into preempting any, any breakout into full conflict over this matter? I think from the government side, we are doing everything possible that we should not escalate it into a full-blown war. I think no one will benefit that. We know that, you know, you know, going out of war, it's going to be a devastating and it would have uh, a cascading impact across the whole of Africa. I think that is the least scenario that we're looking into. I mean, all options are on the table. We've been very consistent and clear that the Ethiopian government that they should have to back down and roll back their decision uh, uh, with the MOU. Should they choose that one, I think we have a peaceful and alternative path that would also allow them to also access in Somalis. See, I think that's what the, what the president articulated very well. Can you tell me about the, the significance of foreign investment at the moment in Somalia? I'm particularly thinking of the UAE and also of Turkey. Turkey is running the airport and the seaport, at least. How significant is that to stabilizing and, and uh, pushing Somalia along its path to peace and prosperity, which is, of course, the objective? The economic recovery of the country is incredibly and remarkably encouraging in many ways. Uh, you have uh, an virtually all international, not all, but I would say major international carriers such as Turkish Airlines, Qatar Airways, Kenya Airways, Ethiopian Airways. All of them have a daily flight coming out of Mogadishu. And this all signifies that, you know, we are on a path of a full economic recovery. And I think there is a degree of uh, uh, confidence among the foreign investors that, you know, Somalia not only... Um, is a story of a security or a story of a drought, but also a story that should be invested in. And I think that is really coming in full force. There are a number of investments taking place in the country, uh, primarily within the telecommunication and health sector, uh, some of them uh, by the Turkish and some of them by also other Europeans and foreign countries. And that is really sweeping in the country. You know, for example, the UK is investing uh, uh, Somaliland sport. Uh, you know, there are also other investments in, in other key economic infrastructures in the country. So we are slowly and gradually uh, coming out of the wood. And there is now a huge and positive uh, uh, note to be, uh, uh, to be positive about as well. And I've heard that um, there is a, a new trend sweeping in many parts of Somalia and many girls born are being called Istanbul. Is that right? <laughs> well, one thing is very clear: we have unbiased love for for Turkey, uh, simply because uh, you know they are not uh, not only a Muslim, but also they have been with us when I think we needed the most, and that's about a ten years ago when Somalia was f- facing a biblical drought that was putting millions of Somalia at risk, and that's when the uh, president of Turkey Erdogan visited in Somalia in one was regarded as singularly the most bravest visit ever in, in, in the continent or in, in Somalia. And it's no secret that we love Turkish delights and there's a lot of Turkish investment and there's a lot of uh, economic integration between the two countries. 
and also some educational integration as well uh, to countries. So giving uh, Istanbul to our girls, it's one way of saying thank you. Our thanks to Abdi Hakim Ayinte. And Patrick, we were really impressed by Abdi, weren't we? A young professional who's returned to Somalia to help build his country. Yeah, he's, he returned to Somalia 15 years ago and he's toughed it out um, amid a pretty deadly insurgency. And he's still lending his uh, technical knowledge and political optimism uh, to rebuild the country. And I, th- I think it's absolutely tremendous uh, what he and that generation of returnees are trying to do in Somalia. And I think we've just got to hope that they succeed because that is surely the future. All right. Let's, let's find out a bit more now, Vero, about what you've been up to. What have you been concentrating on? You've been looking at your home country of Cameroon, I think. Yes, indeed, Martin. And the, the fact that for the last seven years, the civil crisis in Cameroon have gone on unabated displaced millions of people, thousands of them now in, in, in IDP camps, in neighboring countries, people unable to go back to their villages because most of these villages were raised down, no agriculture, no schools, nothing is really functioning. Some of the roads are completely annihilated. So it's been a very, very difficult time with the armed conflict going on, different groups. You don't know who is who anymore. Your life is in your hands. You can travel at certain times of the day or night. Gunshots can be heard at any time and everybody's running to, for safety. It's just been really, really sad. Yeah, Vero, that sounds appalling. It sounds like that uh, Cameroon is something that we should look at uh, in a a later programme. So uh, let's bookmark that, okay? Now, let's turn to Malawi. The government in Lilongwe has embraced an ambitious programme of digitisation, including the use of artificial intelligence. So we want to find out more about how a poor country like Malawi, with fewer than 20% of the population having access to electricity, that's according to the World Bank, how can they actually benefit from tech and AI? So we've turned to Martin Kalima, who's Manager of Tech and Digital Transformation in Malawi for the Tony Blair Institute, and he's talking to us from the capital, Lilongwe. Welcome, Martin. Really good to talk to you. Tell us about the programme, and at what stage is Malawi in this quest for digital transformation? Thank you very much, Martin, and uh, thank you very much. Very nice to meet you on this platform, Vero. Um, so, yes, uh, M- Malawi as a country is uh, on a path to uh, digital transformation. I would start with the infrastructure. The country right now uh, has laid over 3,000 kilometers of national fiber backbone network. And this is important because uh, this is a network now that's connecting major sectors of the economy, including uh, government services uh, and others. We are one of the very first countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, so is this where the program is starting? The program is starting at the top, if you like. So it's starting with um, establishing connectivity between government departments. Is that where the priority is at the moment? Infrastructure has to be a priority, and that's what the government has prioritized. Uh, We cannot talk of digital transformation if we do not talk of digital skills. So digital skills uh, among the citizens and the workforce in the government is also one priority that the government has uh, focused on. It now gets uh, down now to the actual service delivery. What do we do now uh, to make sure that we are streamlining service delivery using the infrastructure that's there, using the digital skills that have been provided to the to the citizens and to and to the workforce? So those are the priorities that the government has uh, has has focused on. Martin Mulibuanji, uh, and uh, I must <laughs> say, <laughs> I must say that's a very very wonderful thing your company is trying to do for your people, but what are the challenges and how would this change the lives of the average Malawian? Because it sounds very high tech and I don't know if the people really understand what you're doing. I think for the common Malawian, uh, 
we would now begin to translate all this into service delivery. Uh, I think that's a language that uh, now a common person would understand. So I'll give you an example. Financial transactions. Okay. One example that I can cite is uh, a recent report uh, that was uh, done by the Reserve Bank of Malawi uh, in 2023. This report revealed that in 2023, uh, most of the transactions that were reported in the national payment system came from mobile money systems, uh, people using their mobile phones to transact or to access uh, financial services and all that. That's what now uh, a common Malawian can begin to understand to say all the investment that the government is doing in bringing internet connectivity, in bringing uh, technology infrastructure in the country is translating now into uh, critical services like access to uh, financial services, uh, 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 business transaction through business transactions through uh, mobile money services and all that. Another example that I would also highlight is TBI, uh, we supported the government to come up with e-payment systems for services or uh, government institutions that transact on non-tax revenue. Uh, so we started with the, a critical one, like the National Registration Bureau. You agree with me that the, the ID is uh, the anchor of uh, all the uh, services uh, that, uh, that the government is providing to the uh, citizens. Now, what we noted was the one component that was actually being uh, uh, crucial uh, for uh, 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 the, the common citizens to access uh, ID applications and all that was when it comes to payment. So I apply for an ID and then I, have to, I had to travel uh, some kilometers to make a payment uh, and then I go back to the registration point uh, to complete the transaction and then this actually was making the transaction to take longer uh, if not days uh, so what we did was to say okay can we uh, look at a more efficient way of the payments because I don't have to all the time to travel to the treasury cashier office uh, to make these payments and all that and then come back uh, to the application for uh, the registration point so what what we did was to support the government to come up with uh, a, an e-payment system for the ID. So what happens is now, uh, in a space of uh, minutes, you apply for your ID, and then on your mobile phone, uh, you make the payment. Instead of you traveling kilometers for a payment, you come back, you make a payment. Uh, you make a payment right there, and then the next desk or the next office is processing your ID. So these are examples that people now begin to understand to say, okay, all the efforts that the government is doing are translating now into efficiency and service delivery. So Martin, are you now saying somebody who is in, in Korongo Korong in the north or somebody who is in the Chole tea plantation can actually access all this when you still have... The, uh, ep epileptic supply of electricity around the country. How do you intend to make sure this moves or that this transaction is smooth? Well, uh, I, th I think as Martin said the uh, uh, earlier, yes, uh, I think we have a lesser percentage of the population that are connected to electricity. Uh, but you would notice that some of these services, uh, like this e-payment service, uh, does not necessarily require electricity connection because, I mean, we have right now, I think we, we are looking at the, uh, the mobile phone usage uh, in the country. The recent data on mobile phone usage in the country is telling us that uh, we are at 56, not usage, but uh, mobile phone ownership rather. We are at 56%. And this is uh, compared to 2019 when we were at 43%. Now, of that 56%, you will notice that 52% uh, or 52.3% thereabout, is the rural masses. Uh, and then the 78% 70, uh, and there thereabout are uh, 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 urban, urban masses. Now, you'd see that the mobile service providers have provided platforms that uh, would be seamless in terms of transactions. The USSD pl uh, uh, platforms where uh, people would use uh, just uh, simple text, simple text message-based uh, transactions to transact uh, on that. Uh, but then still coming back now to the issue of electricity connectivity, knowing that where we are going, would still need now, uh, because we are moving towards a huge uh, transformation in terms of tech, we still need now the connectivity. The government is investing a lot 
uh, in the connectivity. Uh, there's a lot of uh, investors that have come in into the country to invest in uh, solar connectivity, which is complementing the main grid that the government has. There are specific sites that, as we are talking right now, uh, the government has prioritized to say the rural markets and others. Um, Martin, um, tell us about how the Malawian government, which is not terribly wealth wealthy, um, how is it managing to afford this? What kind of funding model is being used to roll out these uh, technologies? Well, we have programs that are running on grants uh, from partners like the World Bank. We have a Digital Malawi project uh, that is uh, a World Bank funded project. And this is a project that has uh, enabled connectivity in most of the government sites. Uh, the fiber connectivity program that I talked about, this is a Chinese funded project. Of course, it's a loan from the Chinese government. We do get support from development partners. We do get support as a country. We do get support from development partners in terms of grants uh, and, in, uh, and, and, and loan facilities. So that's why the government is able to pull, uh, uh, to, to pull off these uh, achievements. Now you're getting uh, into digitization. You're talking about big data. Uh, big data and people's privacy needs protection. What is the government putting in place in terms of the regulatory environment? Well, a uh, very good question. So towards the end of last year, uh, the government has enacted a data protection bill, which is fundamental as when we are talking of digital transformation, because now there has to be assurance of uh, people's privacy to people's data. So several regulations have been uh, developed to support uh, to support the act. And that's uh, one of the foundational steps that the government has taken. And when we are talking of, uh, I, I think, Martin, when we were talk, chatting the other day, I shared with you that uh, we have also, as a government, we have also taken steps now to begin to talk of AI. I wouldn't say we are there uh, to now begin to say, okay, uh, this is it. But uh, foundational steps have, have been taken. Uh, in 2023, last year, we convened, and TBI led on this one, we convened a big summit, an AI for Leaders Summit, which brought together both locals and uh, uh, some experts from the region to talk about if Malawi is to begin to talk about AI, what are the uh, foundational steps that have to be taken. So there's a roadmap that was created uh, to say, okay, we need uh, to begin to look at the enabling policies. Uh, we need to look at the enabling regulations and all that so that we can now begin to talk of AI. Institutions like the Malawi University for Science and Technology, uh, they have established centers uh, centers of excellency on AI. Uh, and actually right now, they're about to start rolling out uh, data science trainings uh, uh, for uh, uh, various uh, students and, and even uh, other, other citizens. So these are some of the foundational steps that have been taken. The Tony Blair Institute, Martin, advocates AI as a, a, a tool of improvement in terms of governance. How is that likely to work? Well, let's look at it from different perspectives. If we are talking of uh, AI uh, enabled service delivery. Let's let's take for example health service delivery. We need to look at the uh, data analytics. We we have big data in health. We need to look at how decisions uh, could be made. Uh, how do we begin to analyze uh, all the health data that we have? Uh, can AI play uh, play a role in all that? Uh, let's look at the agricultural services. How do we bring in AI to begin to support farmers in terms of predicting the weather pattern? predicting what crops to plant and all that. So I think the point is just to look at what can AI play, uh, what role can AI play uh, across all the service delivery structures uh, to uh, bring efficiency in terms, of, uh, in terms of service delivery. Martin, can I just quickly ask, how have people reacted to the fact that this is what you're trying to do to create an enabling environment for them to live better lives? Have they been very receptive or they are skeptical because there are still people who don't believe in all this. They think I need at least at the end of the day to have something in my stomach to go to bed and sleep properly than some high fluted ideas that may not change my life in any shape or form. <laughs> Uh, well, well, that's 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 an interesting question. For one to accept a uh, new idea or an initiative, I think they have to see what is in need for them. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say that there has been 
like comprehensive uh, analysis to see how uh, the reception has been like. But I think we can judge uh, from the reactions on the small, small wins that uh, we have seen. Like, for example, I talked about about the uh, the e-payment systems. Uh, I, I think the the reception uh, was great in the sense that uh, it's bringing efficiency and saving their time. So that brings uh, brings excitement uh, in the, the masses. Martin, when I was in Malawi at one point, during the introduction of the Deca bus, people didn't understand the concept of having just one driver at the bottom and an empty uh, seat upstairs with no driver there. And most of them refused to go upstairs. And I had... I, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering with this technology that you are trying to give them, are, are they asking you? <laughs> I, I talked about digital skills. Um, the so so the the I think the delivery is being done as a, as a whole package. It's uh it becomes it becomes hard. You bring all these tech transformation and all that to the masses, but they don't know how to use technology. It's hard for them to accept. And that's why now I was saying the government has invested actually uh, in digital skills uh, capacity building, digital skills training, to get the people now understand to say what is it uh, that the government is uh, bringing to them. I'll, I'll cite an example. The TBI worked with the government recently uh, to train uh, the workforce in the civil service. I think we trained about over 100 civil servants in digital skills uh, across different levels, uh, beginners and those that are at least have somewhat knowledge. And that is trickling down. The, the digital Malawi project that I talked about has a component that is also looking at digital skills training for the public just to make sure that all this transformation as it is coming, uh, the public knows exactly to say, okay, this is what is in need for us, and this is exactly how we need to use tech. It, it, we, there's so much opportunity as, as far as tech is concerned in Malawi, but the question is, uh, do the citizens know how to, how to use tech? So the government is investing in digital skills as well. So that addresses those fears. I, I have been on a double-decker bus uh, <laughs> when, I was, when I was a child, it was it was really it was really hard to be convinced to get onto the double decker to go onto the upper deck when you see that there's no one driving it up there. I agree with you. I agree, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm just hopeful that maybe Patrick is is Patrick. Are you with us? Uh, yes. Well, either I'm with you or AI is with you. One one of the two. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess um, I, I've come in and out of this conversation, Martin, unfortunately, um, but it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I, 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 what we're now seeing, and I, I don't know if this is going to take you off your track, is particularly in the West, the increasing use of AI in, in politics and uh, deep fakes, but um, AI constructed campaigns on social media and the like. And I, I wondered, um, in terms of the, the difficulties or the downsides of AI, whether you worry that it's, as it is in the West, beginning to distort political campaigns in the West. Do you think it's going to distort politics in Africa and you'll get a lot more sort of fake uh, political campaigns, unpopular leaders appearing to be very popular on social media thanks to AI? <laughs> well... Uh, it's, uh, I think those are fears that uh, are there across, but it uh, speaks as well to what I had alluded to earlier to say, uh, what are the, the legal and regulatory frameworks that have been established as countries are embracing AI? So I think that's one of the critical uh, issues to look at. Uh, and the, when we're in the AI summit that I had alluded to earlier on, uh, one of the critical components that we looked at is, was to say, okay, uh, as a country, we need to seriously think of uh, the regulatory frameworks as far as AI is concerned, so that we are uh, we are protecting people across from all angles uh, so that we do not have scenarios where there's uh, massive abuse of AI. I mean, it's very early days everywhere, isn't it? Because uh, the West isn't very good at regulating AI either, as we're seeing with the current um, US election campaign. And, and I, I think as the... I, I take it as... Uh, uh, 
a learning journey. So we are learning on the, <laughs> for lack of a better word, as, as far as AI is concerned, we would say learning on the job. <laughs> Can I jump in now and say a big thank you, Nima, out of Lilongwe. Thank you very much indeed for taking us through the ins and outs of the digital transformation ambitions of Malawi. And Veronique, thank you for the double decker box anecdote. <laughs> And I will say to Martin Zikumu Wambiri. Zikumu Wambiri Nanunso. Oh, okay. This is really showing off. Thank you, Martin. That was really interesting. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, but perhaps you are in the French capital, and of course, the first round of elections due at the end of the week. How's it looking? Could France really have a 28 year old far right prime minister by next month? Yes, I mean, the guy you're talking about is uh, Jordan Bardella, who is 28. So he's a good 10 years younger than President Emmanuel Macron's last uh, prime minister, Gabriel Attal. Um, and it's looking extremely tight uh, in terms of will the far right uh, get a working majority in the, in the next uh, National Assembly in France? Right now, they're, they're tipped to get about 240 seats, uh, which they will bring a few fellow travellers in from the so-called centre-right, which is leading to the far right, um, and they could, they could control the government. That gives them the prime minister's job, and they would get some of the most important ministries. So this essentially will be the first far right, some would say neo-fascist government, France has had since uh, the occupation of the Second World War and the Vichy government. So it's a big moment for France. Um, so why should this matter to Africa and indeed to Africans? Well, it matters on every single dimension because what France does or doesn't do in Africa is of great importance in West and Central Africa. So uh, French African policy is in turmoil anyway, even before the far right uh, started winning more votes. Um, but it, what you're seeing is uh, the Senegalese former prime minister, uh, Aminata Toure, coming out very, very strongly and, and saying this election is a global election. It's important for Africa uh, because the far right has a record of uh, racism and uh, very uh, restrictive immigration controls. Uh, they also have a record going back to the National Front, which was the former party that Marine Le Pen ran before she changed the name to Rassemblement National. Um, and, and they were very violent, and uh, much of their violence was racist. And they, they, she cites a case of them throwing a, a Moroccan demonstrator in the, in the Seine, where he, he, River Seine, where he drowned. So there's a real fear that uh, if the far right win in France, that would step up the level of racist violence in the country, amongst other things. It would also um, give free rein to the already fairly aggressive policing ta tactics use, used in France against demonstrations by people of a leftist persuasion or um, mul mul multiracial demonstrations. So uh, th there's a real fear that it's going to change the climate of French politics if the far right get in. Well, we've already seen that uh, outpouring of, of vile racist abuse uh, to the singer Aya Nakamura. Remember, we did a show about that not too long ago. That's um, right. And we've, yeah. we've also now, haven't we, from some of the French uh, national football team, Les Bleus, um, many of whom, of course, are of immigrant stock. Well, in fact, mo most of them are um, from Im immigrant stock. That's absolutely right. The captain, uh, Mbappe, Kylian Mbappe, his dad is Cameroonian and his mum was from Algeria. Uh, his, uh, and his uh, teammate, uh, Marcel Thuram, uh, is, is from the Caribbean. And he, they made the point, um, Thuram made the point that there, there is zero disagreement within the team that the far right Rassemblement National must be stopped uh, at the National Assembly elections. It will be a disaster for the country if they win. And Mbappe concurred saying, I don't want to be the captain of a football team that doesn't represent the values I believe 
I, that I hold dear to my heart, the traditional French revolutionary values of liberté, fraternité, and égalité. Uh, and so they, they've come out very, very strongly. And that's hugely significant because of we're right in the middle of the Euros football tournament uh, across the continent. And France is one of the countries that's tipped to win. So uh, what Mbappe and Saram says um, is hugely important to the national morale. And as people watch the football, they're going to have, have it in the back of their minds. Right. Vero, any thoughts? Well, I'm just wondering, uh, it brings us to this scenario in France and in some other countries in Europe where if you're of foreign descent, if you're doing well, you are a French citizen, you are applauded, you are worshipped, to say the least. But then as soon as you start faltering or you're not doing well, you are reminded of where you came from. You are referred to as Cameroon born or Nigerian born or South African born. But as soon as you become the hero and make them <laughs> proud, oh, you are French <laughs> national, <laughs> you are doing well for them. So, but with what uh, Kylian Mbappe and the rest are doing in, in the national French team, will people listen to that? I, I think it will have an effect because Mbappe is a tremendously popular guy. I mean, he was playing for Paris Saint-Germain you know, the best football team, most successful football team in the country. He's just an incredible player. I mean, he's as, you know, some people would say he rates up there with, with Pele uh, and Maradona. I mean, he's an amazingly good player. Um, and so he represents sort of uh, excellence on anyone's uh, measure. Uh, and um, he's been fairly sort of um, balanced in what he's saying. He's trying, so I'm not, I'm standing up for values. And I think people do take this seriously. The question is, if Mbappe decides to sit on his bench and and refuses to play, would all the other players do the same? And if they do that, it will be a big revolution in France, even more than the revolution that we know that is where led to the storming of the Bastille and bringing down the government and all that. But it's a situation where we need, really need to watch and see because football is a uniting force in every country on the planet Earth. Absolutely, Vero. Well, we can thank Patrick for that. That's it for this edition of Africa Here and Now. If you're enjoying the conversations, go to our website, www.africahereandnow.com. All past episodes are there and there's other interesting stuff there too. We're available on all major audio platforms, as well as on your smart speaker. And we're on YouTube. Follow us on the socials. We're on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on X at Martin Dennis. Get in touch. We recorded this on Monday, the 24th of June, 2024. Our producer is Anne Busby. Our original music is by Enric Adam. Anna DeWolf Evans and Charlie Pandon put everything together. Our thanks to our guests, Abdi Hakim and Martin. And from Patrick, Veronique, and me, thank you for your company.